begin, a very, very warm welcome to you all, and particularly to Naomi, attending, I think, for the first time. And it's splendid to have you uh, with us, uh, Duncan. I wonder if you, you get the prize for being the furthest, uh, the furthest away from Glasgow uh, on this particular <laughs> occasion, perhaps. Thank you. A warm welcome to you all. We gather on this, the Sunday after St Andrew's Day. And you'll remember last year there was a very effective service when people were able to all contribute pieces about what being in Scotland meant uh, to them. Uh, so there is a, a, a Scottish theme at this time of the, of the year. And yet I am to be speaking to you about that highly uh, distinguished Englishman, uh, the Englishman James Martineau, a gentleman of French Huguenot descent, but definitely an Englishman. But on this particular uh, occasion of speaking of James Martineau, you might perhaps say that I shall be putting a kilt on him. That is an expression amongst newspaper people, I'm told, putting a kilt on it. And I thought that it would find favor with our minister emeritus, John Clifford. So there, there it is, we come to the uh, chalice lighting uh, part of our, our service. I was impressed that uh, last uh, Sunday service, Jim had his own personal chalice uh, within, within his room. Uh, and um, uh, once Ali has shown us the chalice lighting, I'll show you that I have my own uh, chalice here to be lit as I sit here in my own home. There is our chalice and the, the flame is lit. And uh, the words I'm going to read are by James Martineau. Uh, from his work entitled Hours of Thought on Sacred Things. Those who tell me too much about God, who speak as if they knew his motive and his plan in everything, who are never at a loss to name the reason of every structure and show the tender mercy of every event, who praise the cleverness of the eternal economy, and patronize it as a masterpiece of forensic ingenuity, who carry themselves through the solemn glades of providence with the springy step and jaunty air of a familiar, do but drive me by the very definite, definiteness of their assurance into an indefinite agony of doubt and impel me to cry, ask of me less and I shall give you all. Our opening words from Hours of Thought on Sacred Things. In Martineau's uh, essay, he contrasts theology, uh, a knowledge of or intelligent schemes about divine things with religion, uh, the inward consciousness of God, he defines it. Theology as the critique of religion always stands at one remove from its reality. And he writes, if you are bound to a confession, meaning a creed, you are not free as a scholar, but skillfully securing your own preconceptions. He condemns magnificently antiquarian punctiliousness in the education of the clergy. But ironically, having swept away so much, it is because Martineau tells us still too much about God for many Unitarians, that many have a problem with his essential Christian faith. Now, my title tonight, Meeting Mr. Martineau, uh, of course, owes its choice uh, mainly to the joy of alliteration. Uh, Martineau was Dr. Martineau, famously Dr. Martineau. He was hugely doctored by universities. From 1872, he collected doctorates from Harvard, Leiden, Edinburgh, Oxford, and Dublin. But meeting, I suppose, I wanted to convey a sense of presence, a sense of personal connection. And Mr. as the title I give the revered and reverend, uh, Mart uh, reverend Mr. Martineau is as personal as I can get in greeting this great sage. Uh, and he gives us this definition of the saints and prophets who by the higher measures of closeness and intensity of union appear between the human spirit and the divine. And I was thinking that no doubt God always and still 
calls him James, mm -hmm. and not perhaps Jim at all. Mm -hmm. The front cover you see in front of you of the Enquirer uh, was from July 2005. And it contained what must have been for me one of the first times I, uh, articles I read about James Martineau. And it's by one of our foremost Unitarian historians, Alan Rustin. And he mentions to the reader, didn't we very recently have lots about Martineau in this paper? Uh, and now we're having lots more about Martineau. Well, that was because uh, in the year 2000 uh, was celebrated the, uh, uh, or noted the centenary of the death of Martineau in the year 1900. And then along came the year 2005, and that was the bicentenary of his birth in 1805. He was born in Norwich, and his family were very loyal members of the uh, Octagon Chapel uh, in Norwich. Uh, Martineau, a hugely influential religious uh, philosopher, uh, writes Rustin, led us away from dead and unsustainable belief in biblical text. It may be a surprise to newer readers of the Enquirer to learn that Unitarians in the early 19th century justified all their faith from the Bible. Any challenge they received was immediately met with a biblical text to justify their position. Martineau cited the new biblical scholarship then coming from Germany and argued that the text needed to be looked at in wider terms. Moreover, he also introduced the idea of the enlightened conscience, which he suggested was the new seat of authority in religious matters. And Rustin, in this, I suppose, the, the first published article I had read about uh, uh, James Martineau writes this, whether or not you like him and his beliefs, he is undoubtedly the most significant British Unitarian thinker of the last 150 years. There's no one else to equal him. His influence remains with us, though it's mostly indirect. He would not have approved of us if he were alive today. From his point of view, we have gone almost entirely the wrong way. <laughs> and now, Ali, can we have a screen showing us a slide showing us uh, Glasgow Unitarian Church as it stood at the corner of Pitt Street and St Vincent Street. Mm. And I'll continue with this about Martineau that Rustin says uh, he always said that in personal belief he was a Unitarian and never deviated from that affirmation. That was to say in doctrinal theological terms, he was a Unitarian. And Martineau preached and worshipped in chapels where Unitarian principles were presented. But, and this is the point to which I give emphasis, he would not support a congregation which called itself Unitarian, as he believed this limited the possibilities of development. And the reason uh, I show here the engraving of Glasgow Unitarian Church was that notwithstanding Martineau's concerns about churches calling themselves Unitarian, and the name of this congregation has always been Glasgow Unitarian Church, uh, the uh, inaugural service, the opening of this building in 1856, uh, had as the guest preacher Dr. James Martineau. A very uh, personal uh, connection here because the first minister to preach in that building was James Martineau. Mm. And the last minister <laughs> uh, in the building was our very own John Clifford. Mm -hmm. uh, but this before our move to Barclay Street uh, in the 1980s. Well, having uh, set the scene and the place, uh, let us uh, listen to the singing of the first of our hymns tonight, 
hymn number 136 from the Green Book, Our Kindred Fellowships. everyone. Uh, and for the first of the readings uh, tonight, uh, I'll later let you know how I managed to find this newspaper article, a cutting discovered quite as a golden needle hidden in the haystack of historic newspapers. And I felt it gave me the most wonderfully immediate appreciation of the huge esteem in which Mr. Martineau was held uh, during his lifetime. So I'm quoting from uh, a newspaper article which uh, appeared on the 24th of April, 1888, uh, and uh, James Martineau's birthday was on the 21st of April of that year. And the newspaper is entitled, Address to the Reverend Dr. James Martineau. The following address was presented to the Reverend Dr. Martineau on Saturday, it being his 83rd birthday, signed by over 600 representatives, representative men of letters, philosophy and science, by many universities and college professors in England, Scotland, Ireland, Germany, France, Holland and America by representative members of the Anglican and Nonconformist Churches of England, by those belonging to the various sects of the Scottish Presbyterian Church, in America by the bishops of the Episcopal Council and the clergy of all denominations, by the headmasters and many of the staff of the great English public schools, by members of both Houses of Parliament and many others who recognise the services which Dr. Martineau has rendered to philosophical and religious thought during his long life of usefulness. 
to Dr. James Martineau, Doctor of Divinity, Doctor of Laws. We desire to express to you on your 83rd birthday the feelings of reverence and affection which are entertained towards you, not only by your own communion, but by members of other Christian churches who are acquainted with your character and writings and by many workers in other spheres than that to which your life has been devoted. We thank you for your help which you have given to those who seek to embrace the love of truth with the Christian life. We recognize the great services which you have rendered to the study of philosophy and religion, and we congratulate you on having completed recently two great and important works at an age when most men, if their days are prolonged, find it necessary to rest from their labors. You have taught your generation that both in politics and religion, there are truths above party, independent of contemporary opinion, and which cannot be overthrown, for their foundations are in the heart of man. You have shown that there may be inward unity transcending the divisions of the Christian world, and that the charity and sympathy of Christians are not to be limited to those who bear the name of Christ. You have sought to harmonize the laws of the spiritual with the laws of the natural world, and to give to each their due place in human life. You have spoken to us of the hope beyond this world, you have given rest to the minds of many. We admire the simple record of a long life past in the strenuous fulfillment of duty, in preaching, in teaching the, the young of both sexes, in writing books of permanent value, a life which has never been distracted by controversy and in which personal interests and ambitions have never been allowed to have a place. In addressing you, we are reminded of the words of scripture, his eye was not dim nor his natural force abated, and we wish you yet a few more years both of energetic thought and of honored rest. And on the theme of putting a kilt upon Dr. Martineau, let me say that this was a reading from the Elgin Courant, a very high quality newspaper within what might of old have been called the province of Murray, uh, the Elgin Courant, and the last line of the cutting says, Dr. Martineau generally spends the summer months in Strathspey. And here is a royal picture. Uh, you will all recognize the princess royal. Uh, what you may not, Im you, you probably recognize uh, uh, me, as I appear, you might say, in the role of uh, uh, Joseph and his coat of many colors. Uh, and beside the lectern is a large silver communion cup. That is one of the Glasgow Unitarian Church's communion cups. There were four communion cups all presented to the church in the 1850s and therefore uh, complementing the opening of the new of the new church building uh, and on this occasion it was a gathering of the grand antiquities society of, of glasgow uh, when i managed to find myself in the chair it was arranged that we would donate present to the Trades House of Glasgow, one of the four communion cups. Uh, the reason being that this is a, was an event taking place in Trades Hall. It was within that very room that Glasgow Unitarian Church was founded in 1810. It was within that very room that and many of you were there that we had the uh, bicentennial service, uh, a, a, a wonderful celebration. And as you will see, it was within that very hall uh, that the communion cup was presented to the deacon convener uh, in the presence of uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Anne the Princess Royal. Uh, the next of my readings uh, is about uh, Mr. Martineau, as I shall call him, 
giving a wonderfully affecting speech about Queen Victoria. And therefore, whilst I'm giving you this reading, it's a, it's a long reading from uh, a newspaper cutting, um, uh, this uh, picture will remain on the screen. And appropriately enough, uh, the Princess Royal is surely the most famous of all the great, great, great granddaughters of Queen Victoria. So let me uh, read from the Elgin Courant, and it was uh, published 5th July, 1887, the golden jubilee year of Queen Victoria. And it's set in Kincardin, Kincardin on Spey, in Strathspey. The school board gave a holiday that the children attending the school might have a jubilee rejoicing. On account of some friends who could not attend the previous week, it was put off until Friday last. Mrs. Shaw of Achgaurish Farm, on whose farm the school is, invited them to tea, which was served out on a lovely hoch among birch trees near the house. The children, so neat and tidy with their teacher, Miss Geddes, arrived at three o'clock. They had tea first at four o'clock and then at half past six with an abundant supply of good things. Their or orderly manner and politeness were very much admired and reflected the greatest credit on their teacher. Among those present and who were most attentive in the successful entertainment of the young people were Mr. Mrs. Shaw and Miss Shaw of Gourish, the Reverend Dr. Martineau, Miss Martineau, and Miss Gertrude Martineau of the Polcher of the Mercus. And then follows a list of some nine people uh, who are also mentioned as having been particularly successful in entertaining the young people. The last of whom mentioned is one, Mr. Gordon Achgaurish. The school board and several friends contributed towards prizes in books and money, which were eagerly contested in the many games so heartily enjoyed. Stirring violin music was supplied, and on the lovely lawn, the children danced most joyfully. No doubt the most attractive feature in the entertainment was an address on the Queen, which Dr. Martineau gave during the afternoon at the request of the Reverend Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant in introducing this distinguished scholar and the beautiful writer just returned from being presented to the Queen and whose nephew had just been knighted, alluded to the high honour he had conferred upon them by being present and to how thankful his sister, uh, this is Mr. Grant's sister, Mrs. Shaw, felt for this as he told the children of the rare treat that was in store for them. Dr. Martineau, then gave an address of about 20 minutes in length, which shall never be forgotten by old or young who listened to it. So touching was it, so appropriate. It had charms that cannot be told for the, age and, for the aged and for children. Dr. Martineau had been presented to the queen when she was crowned, and he was presented to her when she had reigned 50 years. And he went on and as he went on, the youngest children got more and more interested until they fixed their eyes upon him with an eager attention we have scarcely ever seen. And as he concluded, alluding so tenderly to the Queen's sympathy for all in trouble, many an eye was wet with tears. Eloquence well befitted the scene, and it is not often in the lifetime, in our lifetime, that we have had the privilege we enjoyed on Friday afternoon. The weather so delightful, the lovely birch trees shadowing us from the heat of the sun, the broad spey rolling beside us, the Cairngorm mountains looking down from far distance in solemn grandeur, and one of the most honoured scholars in the world, his latest work considered by the spectator to be the greatest philosophic work of this age, speaking to us of the changes of 50 years of the goodness of the Queen of Westminster Abbey when she was crowned and the Abbey on the 21st of June last in words which the old delighted in and which the child could understand. When he finished, cheers over and over again repeatedly sounded through the woods 
and the murmur of the river and stream was lost in them. And we have no doubt that long after those now in manhood and old age have passed away, the children will point out the spot where Dr. Martineau, one summer afternoon, spoke to them so tenderly and so eloquently of the prayer-loving and good Queen Victoria. God save the Queen! And Old Lang Syne, led by Miss Geddes, were most heartily and tastefully sung. An officer in Strathspey who did not wish his name to be mentioned presented each of the children with a very handsome Jubilee medal and they returned to their home so happy and longing for another such meeting. And the, that is the end of the reading, but on the occasion uh, that you see in the photograph, the Princess Royal is laughing and perhaps it was when I was telling her my remarks about Dr. Martineau, uh, this is not comic that he had eight children, but no grandchildren, but he is succeeded by many great, uh, great grand nieces and nephews. And one of that number is Prince George. Prince George of Cambridge, related to the Martineaus through Mr. Middleton. Uh, so a grand royal occasion indeed. But how wise Mr. Martineau was to tell us not entirely to trust to scripture uh, and biblical writings, or indeed anything which is put in newspapers without uh, a certain sense of, of discernment or checking. Um, for I'll read you what appeared in the Elgin Courant by another correspondent uh, later in that month of July, July the 15th, 1887, uh, a contrasting view of what had gone on. A correspondent writes as follows from Kincardin. All things being considered, our little jubilee celebration passed off as well as could be expected. The only noteworthy features about it was Dr. Martineau's address. And it is to be hoped that among the few who heard it, some were present, not relatives of the doctor, who could appreciate the great thinker's words. But apropos of his address, where were the eyes which, according to another report, were wet with tears? Or, leaving this point, where was the room for the school board and a number of friends to contribute prizes in books and money, unless the contributions were restricted to a penny a head? Or where were the many games so heartily enjoyed, really? If the press means to retain the respect of the public, it will not only see to it that its reports are a fair representation of facts, but will also refuse insane effusions in bad English, however much they may please the conceit of a few, or ignorantly flatter the locality from which they hail. And at this we need some uh, refreshment and let's join together in hearing the Unitarian uh, Music Society singing from the Green Book, hymn number 28, the Tides of the Spirit. Oh, oh, oh. 
Well, now I'd like to give you a short uh, address and um, uh, bear in mind the hymn that we've just heard about the uh, about tides and the ebb, the ebb and flow of uh, uh, the ebb and flow of water channels. Uh, when then did I first meet Mr. Martineau? Uh, looking back in my life, I suppose it came from this uh, book. Uh, it's uh, a history of a parish in Strathspey, and it's called In the Shadow of Cairn Gorm. It's not really the relevant uh, parish, but it mentions in a chapter about visitors to Strathspey, it says that Dr. Martineau spends his summers in Strathspey and mentions some of his famous friends all names that I did recognize as uh, philosophers of the 19th century came to visit him there. Uh, it was not a comment that inspired me to follow up and to look up uh, James Martineau in any biographical dictionary. I think I ignored him entirely uh, from having read that line when I was a young man, no doubt in my, I was in my 20s at the, at the time. That was the first time. The second time I heard of James Martineau was in a delicious joke by the Reverend Joy Croft. Now, uh, I uh, wasn't a member of Glasgow, Junior, uh, of Glasgow Unitarian Church in the year 2000, and therefore I wasn't there to be able to read things about the centenary of Martineau's death. I was a member by 2005, uh, indeed a few years before that because uh, I knew Joy Croft. And Joy told me this joke, it wasn't, it wasn't included in a service. I wonder quite why she told me the, 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 jo the joke, but I've already mentioned this evening that the Martineaus were members of the Octagon Chapel in Norwich, the Octagon, a beautiful mid 18th century building. And Joy Croft had been the minister of that church before she came to Glasgow in, the, uh, in 1992, it was. And uh, the joke was about the hobnobbing that went on in the Unitarian uh, uh, community in Norwich uh, in the 19th century. The hobnobbing and uh, hobnobbing from the, the dictionary definition I see is to mix socially, especially with those of perceived higher social status. And Joy's joke, uh, and perhaps it wasn't in these exact words, but this was the nub of it, uh, was uh, that, um, the such and suches spoke to the so and sos, and the so and sos spoke to the Martineaus, and the Martineaus spoke to God. And then the third time that uh, I was aware of the name of James Martineau wasn't. Uh, from that uh, Enquirer article in July of 2005, but it was uh, at the, our worship service in Glasgow Unitarian Church on the 10th of April 2005, three months before the Enquirer, the Enquirer article, uh, and uh, Alistair Bate, our worship leader, was taking the service. And I think it was a significant uh, service. Uh, I kept the text that Alistair uh, uh, gave us on that uh, occasion, and he starts his sermon off. So why a service about James Martineau? Well, the short answer is that on the 21st of this month is the 200th anniversary of his birth, and Essex Hall sent out some reasonably helpful worship resources to help us celebrate his memory. The other reason is that I've always meant to study Martineau's contribution to Unitarian theology, and knew instinctively that I would be broadly in sympathy with his views. Uh, I found it a very interesting uh, service, a very interesting address that Alistair uh, gave us. And uh, I'll quote from the, the way in which um, he ended. He said, the tendency over the last century has, I fear, been to confuse theological progress with mere secularization. For example, I regularly visit a lady who says of the general populace that they are all Unitarians, really. 
they just don't know it. If she is right, then it cuts both ways. The views of many Unitarians are now almost totally indistinguishable from those who did not attend church at all. In rejecting the Bible as the source of authority in Unitarianism and establishing conscience as the basis of authority in religious matters, Martineau's own faith did not suffer, said Alistair Bate. In fact, it blossomed as he opened himself up to finding God everywhere. But Martineau had a well-established faith and prayer life to begin with. Those who came after him and attempted to interpret his inclusiveness were among those who opened Unitarianism up to secular and materialist philosophies. It will certainly be interesting to see where the Unitarian theological stream runs next. So there in the first of the echoes from the hymn that we've, we've just had about the running, the running of the streams. And uh, in joining you all again uh, uh, to, for tonight, I was thinking, I was thinking about uh, Alistair, Alistair who took his, uh, his coracle of faith off to another uh, stream uh, a few years after that. Uh, but I suppose all streams flow into the same sea. Uh, I was interested to see I could spot his name easily through the, uh, the internet as the Right Reverend Dom Alistair Bate, the Primus of the Holy Celtic Church International, uh, operating from Switzerland. Uh, I think it's interesting uh, that perhaps as a result of, uh, of Alistair's meeting with Mr. Martineau, he, he Alistair changed his life journey. So that was someone whose talents we admired, uh, followed a different stream after having encountered Mr. Martineau. But my uh, theme tonight, uh, I often say I'm, I'm deeply superficial. And my uh, theme tonight uh, takes a different line, uh, but it's all about following the stream and uh, keeping going so long as the circumstances allow one to move forward. What I very much enjoyed about the uh, Sunday services that we've had on Zoom is that the worship leaders have somehow been able to speak to our condition. Our condition is we are living in this extraordinary, extraordinary time, the age of, the age of COVID. And they've spoken to our, our condition and uh, said things which I think have been encouraging to help us through. Uh, I hope that what I'm going to say is, is helpful. And I'll give you an example of the way in which I've managed to find uh, comfort and interest. I'll start by mentioning another article from The Spectator. The magazine still goes on and it's interesting to read that it accounted Martineau's work, the greatest philosophic work uh, of the age in the 19th century. And this was an article which uh, appeared, however, uh, this year uh, and in October, and it's to, call, entitled Broken Records, Restrictions on the National Archives, are a disaster for historians. Now, this is talking about access to the National Archives at Kew. So you know we are not talking about the Scottish National Archives, or rather the Scottish National, the National Records of Scotland. And the, uh, the author of this article in The Spectator, Guy Walters, writes, uh, he's a professional historian and he's very anxious about the fact that he can't get access to the historical documents that he needs to get access to to carry on his research. And he says the current restrictions are oppressive. Q is only open for four hours and 50 minutes per day, four days per week. And on these days visitors are only permitted to access nine documents and they're only allowed to visit once a week. Well, at this, <clears throat> I think I, I intoned a phrase from Monty Python. Oh, you were lucky. You were lucky, 
uh, four hours and 50 minutes a day because I thought uh, in Scotland we have no access to the historical search room in Edinburgh, uh, the very heart of the national records of Scotland. That facility has been completely closed since the lockdown in March. I checked the um, uh, website tonight just to, uh, to be sure of the current position. Yes, they're still, still closed. It is to be hoped that some form of, of access or service will be provided early in 2021, but still, but still closed. So I found uh, uh, myself, uh, and I'm always, I've always got to apply, apply on with certain bits of historical research. I'm always wanting to get access to documents. I found myself quite thwarted, uh, but rather than the, the stream, the stream welling up behind me and bursting, a, bursting a dam, I suppose the metaphor is that the water wakes its way round obstacles and continues flowing. And going with the flow has its compensations. And the compensation for me was because I couldn't get out and get access to uh, uh, documents. Uh, I subscribed to uh, one of the, uh, the organizations in the heritage business, which allow you to check, check births, marriages and deaths, that sort of thing, but also gives access to old newspapers. And the thing is, the, the golden needle in the haystack, it all depends what you go looking for. It's all in the questions, not in the answers. The questions which allow you to find things which may be of interest to you. And uh, I found the uh, three uh, newspaper articles that I read to you at length, and I regarded them as, as being uh, 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 fruits of solitude uh, through the period of lockdown and through the uh, deprivation of being able to get access to uh, the actual uh, archives that I was looking for. <clears throat> I wasn't looking to find anything about Dr. Martineau. The first one I found was the account of the, the lovely uh, picnic on the Hoch at Ach Gaurish. Uh, and that, just finding that um, article filled my, my mind with uh, uh, tranquility and, and transported me uh, to that very, that very place. Because if you look across from there, you're looking onto the ancient parish church of Kincardine, which is, as I've always felt, a very holy place. It's just the size of an ordinary barn. It's got, a, it's got a churchyard wall around it, so it stands on a little knoll. Uh, but it's, it bears witness to the, uh, the coming of Christianity to Strasbourg, and I suppose it takes us back even to the sixth century to such an occasion uh, as that. It's a very uh, beautiful and tranquil highland, highland scene. And the reason I was, um, I was looking was I was looking for the name Gordon and I was looking for the place at Gaurish. And how uh, parochial, how, how personal is that? The reason I was looking for Mr. Gordon was because I was doing some research about this man who uh, was, well, a Victorian, but so close a relation of mine as to be my grandfather's grandfather's brother. Uh, that's grandfather, grandfather Macpherson brother and the alert amongst you will wonder why was the man called Gordon? Well, they had different fathers. There, there it is. These things, these things happen. But I was excited to find uh, the mention of Mr. Gordon. He was a very, he was a humble shepherd. Uh, he was the shepherd at Archgarish. And he met Mr. Martineau. This world famous philosopher came to that very place on that very date. And, um, there's a point of contact. And it just so happened that I was looking for something and I found Martineau. It is quite a, a, a holy place, Concordance, as I've told you, and I've taken more interest in that James Gordon's grave. James, they were both, uh, they both had the same forename. Uh, I hadn't paid any attention to the fact there was a biblical verse at the bottom of his gravestone, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And I thought that doesn't really sound like one of my relatives, but there it is. It's, that's what appears on his gravestone and he died in 
1898 at the age of 74. So that uh, uh, Mr. Gordon uh, managed to live to see uh, the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. And in that reading that I gave you from the 83rd uh, birthday tribute, a wonderful tribute that was given to uh, James Martineau, uh, he was to live another 12 years uh, and a very active 12 years of, of output. Uh, he um, made uh, uh, all sorts of collections of hymns. Uh, he, uh, of course, was hugely honoured as, as a principal of Manchester New uh, College, hugely influential in the training of Uni Unitarian uh, ministers. Uh, and uh, his influence uh, with us today is, of course, uh, there indirectly, yes, and you'll see, but perhaps uh, he's had a greater influence on some other churches than on the Unitarians, notwithstanding the fact that he identified as a Unitarian in theological matters, and yet was wary about attributing the name Unitarian because uh, he was against people being divided on points of theology and doctrine. Uh, there was at the root of everything, he thought, uh, 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 a religion which was accessible to everyone. Uh, his phrase for that was free Christianity. It's not a very easy phrase to use in Scotland, is it? Not, not after 1843, uh, free, you see, was really, in a sense, no longer free to be used as a word to describe what a, what a church intended. But it, it, it gives us some idea about the, the, the very uh, liberal basis uh, doctrinally uh, on which uh, Martineau hoped that people would continue to worship together uh, because it was possible to have disagreements on points of theology and yet all to adhere, adhere to a certain basic faith. And he saw that definitely as the, as the Christian faith. Uh, and as I said at the, at the very beginning, reading uh, Alan Rustin, you know, uh, whether you like him or not, he's a very influential figure and opinions will disagree as to whether he tells us too much, too much, too much. about God. Uh, at this point, uh, having told you that Martineau uh, produced uh, collections of hymns, you wonder, are we going to end with a Martineau hymn? And there is the Martineau hymn in the Green Book. It's hymn, it's hymn 30, 34, but alas, that's not possible. Um, uh, why not? Well, you know the tune that goes to hymn 34, Where, where is your God? Uh, well, I'll, I might hum, Where is hymn 34? Alas, it's not recorded. The music editor has Martineau discarded. <laughs> It's not included in the Unitarian Music Society's uh, uh, rec recordings that we have, uh, but perhaps if we put in a special request, the next edition of the recordings will include Martineau. But uh, I like the I like the, the hymn uh, that we're going to uh, hear as as in our our closing. Uh, we'll hear the hymn, and after that, uh, I will read a closing prayer. Uh, and I'll explain the closing prayer uh, after the hymn. But it's hymn 208 from the Purple Book, When Our Heart Is In A Holy Place. And it reminds me of Kincardine Church, which I think is a holy place. And it reminds me of my friends in Glasgow Unitarian Church who've mentioned often places which are special to them, where they think there's a special, a special uh, affinity and perhaps an opportunity to focus uh, on the mysterious, the nimious, uh, when they are at that place. And being, as I say, a deeply superficial person, being at a special place, I find, helps me because I haven't that, that vigor of prayerfulness that was so magnificently exemplified in the life of James Martineau.
Mm. Now, my friends, just a very few miles away from that uh, holy place, uh, the, uh, uh, the church at Kincardine, so near to the scene of the Sunday school uh, picnic, so near to the Hochen, which uh, uh, James Martineau gave this uh, address, uh, the varying reports of which uh, I've read to you uh, tonight. Uh, this is uh, the monument at Rothi Mercus, uh, the Martineau monument. It's the pillar uh, erected in memory of James Martineau and also of his daughters. And um, they went to live at the Polkar house nearby every summer for a good many years. And uh, they were no slouches on holiday, <laughs> not at all. And that's explained by this pillar because it was, it was uh, er erected by the wood carvers of Rothemarkas in appreciation of being taught the art of wood carving uh, and of being introduced to uh, so, so many books and so much learning by the presence of uh, Mr. Martineau and his redoubtable, redoubtable daughters uh, living, living there. Um, there's also a little plaque, and it's the only one I know of in Scotland or perhaps anywhere in the world, which says Scottish Unitarian Association. And the little plaque says that the Scottish Unitarian Association paid for the restoration of the monument a good few years ago. <clears throat> and you can probably tell that those are my uh, uh, shoulders in the photograph. Uh, if you're able to pinch the screen and open it, you'll be able to see the front cover of News and Views from a few years ago. And Janet put that photograph uh, on, the, uh, on the cover of News and Views. Uh, another little connection with Glasgow Unitarian Church and James Martineau, uh, who preached the very uh, opening, uh, the very first service uh, in its uh, uh, second church building uh, in St. Vincent Street. Um, well, uh, Jim, thank you. You uh, described uh, our gatherings in the evening as an even song. Uh, we've, had, we've had songs, yes, and the night all around us is very dark. And the closing prayer uh, is a James Martineau prayer, and it was published in 1862. And I'll give it to you an unexpurgated Victorian prayer. And let us receive this as uh, uh, words during the extinguishing of our chalice flame. Eternal God, who hast neither dawn nor evening, yet sendest us alternate mercies of the darkness and the day. There is no light but thine, without, within. As thou liftest the curtain of night from our abodes, take also the veil from all our hearts. Rise with thy morning upon our souls. Quicken all our labor and our prayer. And though all else declines, let the noontide of thy grace and peace remain. May we walk while it is yet day in the steps of him who with fewest hours finished thy divinest work. Amen. <laughs>